Welcome to the Blue Marble Defender series for story number 10, titled The Chips Are Down. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to station WZMR, broadcasting from beautiful downtown Ridgefield, Connecticut. This is your favorite sports announcer, Helen Larkspur, coming to you from our booth above the town sports field on Danbury Road. This broadcast is made possible by our sponsor, Space Spuds Potato Chips, the oldest, tastiest chips in the universe. Their crunch is like the crack of a baseball bat. Trust me, I'm Irish, I'm from Springfield, Massachusetts, and I know potato chips. Space Spuds are the best. Folks are streaming into the stands this sunny April morning for the Fairfield County Little League Championship game between the Ridgefield Red Sox and the Wilton Yankees. The teams are just starting their warm-ups, but you can already feel the tension here. It's no surprise because you can't imagine two better matched teams. Both have 11 wins and one loss, and their sole loss is to today's opponent. Rookie's family had finally stayed in place long enough for him to play a full spring season of Little League. The Blue Marble Defenders had been requested to address problems with extraterrestrials in this area, and Pops had picked Ridgefield as a central place to live. With only an hour's drive or train ride, Mom and he could work in New York City, the two New York State prisons along the Hudson River, Essex, Connecticut, and Otis, Massachusetts. The family had rented a white colonial-style house with lots of trees and stone walls farmers had built when they cleared the land in the 1700s. For Rookie, the best thing about the house was its short bicycle ride to the baseball fields. When they moved, Pops changed from being league scorekeeper to team coach. There was good and bad to having your father as a coach. The good part was car rides to practices and games. The bad part was having a coach with high expectations for you. The, the assistant coach today was sick. He had a, one of these new viruses and was very ill. And Leo took over as acting assistant coach. When they got to the field, Pops rallied the Red Sox and started hitting flies to the outfielders with a fungo bat from the right field line. Leo hit ground balls to the infield while Bobby started his warm-up with Mac, the catcher. Ten minutes later, Pops came to the infield and started pitching batting practice, giving each batter about a half dozen cuts at the ball and three solid hits. Rookie whacked two solid grounders in a hard line drive to left field before Pop said, Next! When batting practice was over and the Yankees took the field, Pops called the team together. Hey, all it's been a good season, he said. Everyone's played well, but most importantly, you played well together as a team. Do your best today, and we'll win the Fairfield County Championships and go on to the state finals. Now, here's today's starting lineup. He read off the players in batting order sequence and continued. Okay, pick a partner and play catch while the Yankees practice. I'm going over to turn in our lineup and to find out if we'll be visitors or home team today. I see two coaches and the umpire coming together and suspect it's for the coin toss. And yes, it is. The coin is a quarter, folks. And if I can read the umpire's sign language, he's saying if it's heads, the Yankees will choose whether or not to be the home team. There's the toss. They're all looking down, and apparently the Red Sox get to choose. The umpire is signaling the Sox players to take the field, so they must have chosen to be the home team. And now the umpire is calling, play ball. So hang on to your seats, folks. This should be an exciting game. Bobby Axe has taken the mound and begun his warm-up with catcher Mac Oji. Those of you who follow Little League might know that when he's not pitching, Bobby plays first base. It looks like the rest of the lineup has only first names, so here's the starting infield. Gene is playing first base, Rookie second, Laura's at shortstop, and Don at third. Whoops, that's all I'll give on the lineup now because the umpire has signaled it's time for the first pitch. Whoopsie-daisy, the first pitch went into the dirt at the outside corner, but Mac dug it out and jumped up and tossed it back. It's the first sign of the tension here, folks. Bobby's taking a short walk around the mound. He's set now and on the rubber. The wind-up and the pitch, 
A fastball down the middle for strike one. It's now a one and one count for Billy, the Yankees center fielder. The outfielders are shallow. It makes sense because Billy is known for getting on base with short pokes through the infield rather than for long balls. And here's the next pitch. He slaps the ball to short. Laura's got it on a big bounce. She sets herself while Jean scrambles to, to the bag and throws a strike for the first out of the game. One away. The ball's making the rounds of the infield as the Yankee pitcher Johnny Weir comes to the plate. A lot of folks call Johnny the Yankees' ace pitcher. He's a square-shaped, big-armed, obviously strong guy and known as a good hitter, too. The stats show a 425 batting average, and you can see the Red Sox respect him because of the outfield has moved back about as far as possible. For those listeners who may not know it, the outfield fence is 200 feet from home plate, so my reading is the fielders must be back about 150 feet. And in case you didn't know it, the bases are 60 feet apart. Here comes the first pitch to Johnny, a swing and a miss, and wow, what a swing! If any birds had been flying over, it might have blown them off course. I see the outfielders taking a step or two back, and it doesn't surprise me. Bobby's got his foot on the rubber, and here comes the second pitch. It's low and outside for a ball. After that huge swing, keeping the ball away from Johnny was a no-brainer. So now, with a one-in-one -one count, Bobby's got to decide whether to tease Johnny with a pitch on one of the corners or to challenge him with one right over the plate. Here's the pitch. There goes a towering foul ball behind third base. Don is drifting back, but the left fielder is racing in. He has priority, and he's calling it. He caught it at his left shoulder for the out, and it's two down. Folks, Bobby took a chance on that last pitch and threw a hard, waist-high fastball on the inside corner. And if Johnny had straightened out that fly ball, it would have meant big trouble for the Red Sox. Bobby struck out the next batter, and the Sox headed for their bench. Good job, Bobby, Rookie called out as he smacked his butt with, a, with his black, bat, black glove. Keep that up, and we're shoe-ins shoe, <laughs> shoe for the state finals. Jean is the Red Sox first batter, and she's watching Johnny intently as he warms up. She's striding to the plate now with that same intensity. This should be an interesting matchup. A powerful arm against a determined hitter. And here's the first pitch. A blazing fastball. In for a strike. Jean watched it go by carefully. I'd say she's sizing him up, folks. Johnny works fast on the mound and is winding for the next pitch. Whoa! Jean squared around against another fastball. It's a bunt. Beautifully executed down the third baseline. The catcher goes out. The third baseman comes in and grabs it barehanded. But Jean's just a step away from the bag, and he holds the ball. Can you hear the crowd, folks? They appreciated that play. Many batters, even some of the very best, have told me how frightening it can be to square around on a pitcher as strong as Johnny. All right now. The Sox have a run around. No outs, and the second baseman coming to the plate. Johnny had been off the pitching rotation when the two teams played during the season, and since this was Rookie's first year in Ridgefield, he'd never batted against him. He heard he was a nice guy, though, quiet, never talkative in a game. But his face looked hard. He clearly was a tough competitor. Before walking to the plate, Rookie asked Leo if he thought he should bunt, too. But Louis, uh, Leo said, nah, hit away. Fair enough, Rookie thought. We want to run, and it's my job to advance the runner from first. As he tapped the plate with his bat and settled his cleats into the dusty batter's box, Rookie reminded himself of Pop's advice to watch at least one pitch go by when facing a pitcher for the first time. A fastball blazed past him and hit the catcher's mitt like a freight train hitting a paper bag. Okay, easy to let a thing like that go by, Rookie thought, but... You can't let yourself be intimidated. You gotta challenge it. Stop thinking, stop feeling, and start hitting. He dug his cleats in deeper and took a big step into the next pitch. Another scorching fastball, and this one he caught on the tip of the bat, sending a line drive foul and almost hitting Laura as she coached first base. But there was something else. Yow! Could you hear that, folks? 
Rookie's bat broke in half when he cracked that foul ball. Half the barrel split off and almost took out an on-deck batter. This game certainly off. The assistant coach, who's also Rookie's brother, I believe, has run out with another bat, and the first base coach has tossed the big broken slice back toward the bench. Rookie's taking a pack practice spring. Salah. Taking a practice swing with a new bat now, and Johnny's glaring down from the mound, looking anxious to throw again. Here comes the next pitch. It's a sharp ground ball down the third baseline. The third baseman neatly backhands it and throws it to second base on a force on Gene. One away and a new run around first, and that brings up the Sox pitcher, Bobby. Bobby squibbed a grounder between the pitcher and third base. The third baseman charged it checked to see if he could get a force at second base, but threw to first for the sure out. The Sox had two out now, Rookie on second, and Mack, a left-handed batter at the plate. He took a big cut at Johnny's first pitch and hit it almost on his hands. It looped with only a little bit of force, but went out to the gap between the first and second baseman. Rookie put his head down, sprinted toward third, and looked up just long enough to see the third base coach waving him toward home. He dug in, gave it all he had. Didn't see any sign of the on-deck batter coaching him at home, but he didn't look up again until he'd completed his hook slide. Clapping and hooting came from the bench. Mac's little pop-up had fallen between the first baseman with a, with a spin that sent it into foul territory. Not heroic, Rookie thought, but a run is a run. At the top of the second, with the Red Sox leading one to nothing. Bobby walked the first two batters and Rookie was worried and he raised the tempo of the infield chatter. Every word is a drop of encouragement, he thought. We need to protect last inning score and that means keeping Bobby in top form. He stopped. He started the next uh, batter with a count of two balls and no strikes. Make him a hitter. Make him a hitter, Bobby. Blow it by him. But the next pitch was high for 3-0 and count, and Rookie amped up the chatter even higher. Make him a hitter! Make him a hitter! Bobby tossed a meatball, and the Yankee center fielder watched it float into him as big as a basketball. He knew his coach would say, let it go by, but this ball was sweeter than anything served up in batting practice. There it was, just above his waist, right where he liked them. The Yankee couldn't resist, and wham! A fly ball went to left field, close to the line. The Red Sox left fielder raced toward the line, but had no chance of it. The runners on first and second knew it, knew it. He had no chance to, and they took off. The lead runner came in, and the next was crossing the plate, standing when the batter pulled up at second base. <sighs> Let down. Things looked bad. The Yankees were poised now for a blowout inning. But the Sox caught a break when the next two batters hit pop-ups for easy, out, easy outs. The Red Sox came to bat in the second inning down 2-1. to one. Pops gave them a peck talk, but the team went down 1-2-3 with a strikeout a grounder to the pitcher and a f foul pop-up to the catcher. Johnny Weir had closed down the side with a total of five pitches. The top of the third started just fine for the Sox. Rookie charged a high, ground, high bounding grounder and tossed it to first for an easy out. Then Gene fielded another grounder at first base and tagged the base herself for a quick second. Momentum seemed to be coming back to the Sox side until the Yankee first baseman tagged Bobby's outside fastball and it flew into center like a rocket. The hit's power seemed to suck away the team's confidence. A runner on second with two outs is seldom a threat. But then Ma Bobby served up another meatball on a platter. Now you might know that a major leaguer can swing a bat as fast as 100 miles an hour. And the oldest, strongest little leaguers can get to about half that. The next batter, the Yankee right fielder, well, he must have been destined to become a major leaguer because he savaged that meatball and the ear-shattering crack reverberated from the forest in the distance. Its first bounce landed in the Sox center fielder's glove, fortunately, but the runner easily scored from second and the Sox spirits went 
to the cellar. Mercifully, the next batter shot a line drive straight at Laura, but the Yankees' half inning ended with them up 3-1. to one. In the bottom of the third, the Sox first batter whiffed on three pitches. When Jean came up to the plate for her second at bat, both the third and the first baseman took two steps forward. They were anticipating that she'd bunt again. She let the first pitch go by for a strike. And then she stepped forcefully to the second one. She tagged a line drive so hard right at the third baseman that he held his glove in front of his face and ducked to protect himself. But the ball hit the top of the glove's fingers and bounced into foul territory. Jean raced to first base. The coach waved her on and she slid to safe into second. Now Rookie stepped up to the plate. Jean had shown the way and Johnny no longer seemed so overpowering. Rookie saw the fielder shifted toward the left. He would have loved to pull one of his trademark surprise hits down the right field line, but Johnny threw just too fast. Better to hit the ball squarely and use Johnny's power against him, he thought. Rookie gripped the bat, released the pressure, then squeezed it even tighter. His upper arms were tense. He had power, too, and he'd use it. Johnny's fast ball started straight down the middle and then pulled toward the inside corner. Rookie had held his bat even farther back than usual, and when he saw the ball coming, he knew it was his pitch, and he uncorked a swing that satisfied every bone in his body. He unleashed a high line drive over the third baseman's head with a spin that pulled it to the left field line. Gene rounded third for an easy score, and Rookie pulled up with a second double of the inning. A strikeout and a pop-up disappointed Rookie's hopes to score again. But the Sox had clawed back one run to end the fourth inning down 3-2. to two. Bobby started the fifth inning with a walk on four pitches, and his fatigue was showing. Pops walked to the mound, talked to him, then he motioned for Rookie to take the ball. Bobby jogged to the bench, and Leo sent the reserve second baseman out onto the field. Rookie wasn't surprised to be brought in to pitch. He'd been part of the Sox four-pitcher rotation during the second half of the season, and it was his turn to take the mound. He didn't enjoy taking over in these circumstances, but he had a job to do, and he wasn't going to waste any energy worrying about his own or Bobby's feelings just now. Here we are at the top of the fifth inning. The Yankees are up 3-2 to two and have a run around first and a new Red Sox pitcher warming up on the mound. His first name's Rookie, but I'm afraid I don't have a family name. I have to tell you folks, though, in spite of his name, he's really not a rookie. My stats show his pitching record is two wins, one save, and no losses this year. And even more impressive is his batting average, a very tidy 460. The umpire signaled to restart the game, so here we go. The wind-up, the pitch, and it's in the dirt. The catcher blocked it, preventing the runner from advancing. First pitch in the dirt. Hmm. That's the same way his predecessor Bobby started in the first inning. That wild pitch doesn't appear to have phased Rookie. He's starting his wind-up. The pitch, strike one. Fast on, on the outside corner. I saw him take a deep breath and smile toward the catcher after that one. Tension is running high. Remember, this may be a little league game, but it's not little in importance. It's for the Fairfield County Championship. Here we go again. The wind-up, the pitch, and a ground ball towards second base. The shortstop, Laura, has it. Steps on second, throws to first in for an unassisted double play. So smooth. The Red Sox have been fielding like champs today. Rookie struck out the next batter, retiring the Yankees in the fifth. And when Rookie jogged up to the bench, Leo slapped him on the back. You're looking good out there, bro. Keep it up. Then Pops addressed his players. It's time for some runs, team. When Johnny unloads one of those fastballs of his, you step into it and crank it. Then he clapped his hands and said, Okay, all, let's show some life and get those runs back. But Johnny continued to dominate, and the Sox went down one two, three. Rookie jogged to the mound for the top of the sixth, determined to shut out the Yankees. 
The sucks were in a 3-2 hole, and if it became deeper, it might kill morale and kill their chances of a county championship. He'd be facing the top of the Yankees' batting order, including Johnny Weir's big swing. It was going to be a daunting task, but he was ready to work his way through it. Folks, here come the Yankees, aiming to extend their lead and ice the game. But they're facing a skilled Red Sox team and a pitcher determined to put them down. The Yankee leadoff batter has been on base twice today and no doubt wants to be there again. Here's the pitch. It's called strike one. There's a lot of chatter around the infield. The Red Sox may be down, but they're not out. This team knows how to make a comeback and knows how to win. But they're behind and have their work cut out for them. We're about to start what I bet will be one of the most interesting baseball innings played in Fairfield County this year. Here's the pitch. A ground ball to third. Don fields it cleanly, the throw, and the out at first. What? No, it's not. The first baseman dropped the ball. A big disappointment for the Red Sox, and no doubt a disappointment for the pitcher who now has to face Johnny Weir with a runner on base. Some pitchers might be rattled by an error at a moment like this, but Rookie seems to have ice in his veins. He's starting his windup, and here comes the first pitch to Johnny. Holy cow, a line drive right back to the pitcher. It could have been fired from a cannon, but Rookie caught it. He fires to Jean at first, and she tags the runner who straight, stay, strayed off the base. Amazing. Simply amazing. Folks, at this moment, we could have a pitcher on the way to the hospital and a dispirited Red Sox team. But instead, we have a double play and new life on the field. Rookie struck out the next batter, and the Red Sox ran in from the field. Pops called out to his players, Hey, the chips are down. This is crunch time. Let's show them what the team spirit can do out there. Let's jump out of this little hole and claim the championship. It's a one-run game, folks, and the Red Sox will win it or lose it in the coming minutes. The final inning seems to be starting just like the first one. Gene is walking up to the plate and staring intently at Johnny, who's glaring back, ready to pitch. Here's the wind-up and the pitch. Oh, my word! Unbelievable! Jean squared around and made the same bunch she made in the first inning, and it caught the Yankees off guard again. She's safe at first. What a canny, classy player. The fans for both teams are on their feet in appreciation. What a super comeback after her error at first base in the top of the inning. Here comes the next batter, the pitcher rookie. I wonder if their matchup will go the same way it did with Jean. Here's the windup, the pitch. It's outside for ball one. Johnny might be feeling a bit tired. That pitch didn't have his usual steam. Okay, here we go. The wind-up, the pitch. It's a hit to right field and nobody's there. The ship to left has been on all game, but with Johnny slowing down a notch, this hitter has taken advantage of it. Jean is racing like a thoroughbred. She's nearly to third and being waved in. The ball is still spinning away from the right field line, and Rookie's already rounding second and heading for third. This is amazing. The right fielder has finally chased it down. She throws to the second baseman. The relay's coming to the plate. A slide. Safe. Game over. Championship decided. What an ending. The Red Sox bench and all the players are throwing their gloves in the air and their fans are cheering. The Yankees also played a splendid game, but as you can imagine, the disappointment is showing on all their faces. Folks, this game has been a true highlight of the season. Thank you for joining me. Your favorite WZMI sports announcer, Helen Larkspur, is signing off now, but I'll be back on the air for more baseball excitement next week. And please remember, today's game was brought to you by Space Spuds Potato Chips, the oldest, tastiest chips in the universe. Their crunch is like the crack of a baseball bat. And that's the end of the 10th Blue Marble Defender story.